Israel's northern border with Lebanon is being bombarded. Hundreds of rockets a day coming in from Hezbollah, hitting homes, hitting um, infrastructure, hitting churches even. And nobody says a word about that in the news, but that's not what the story is about today. Today I want to tell you about the evacuees, people that have left their homes, left their businesses, and are having to make do looking for new places to live, new places to work, and figuring out how to best take care of their family. Imagine that you're a single father raising a nine-year-old autistic son. You live in Israel on the Lebanon border. There are a lot of communities on the Lebanon border. A lot of them are a few miles away, close enough for any rocket to reach. But there are some that are called fence communities. Basically, the outer perimeter fence of your community is the border with Lebanon. And there's attacks on your community all the time, even without a war. There's people trying to get through from the other side into your community and wreak havoc. The army is present on the border. There's always security in the kibbutz. So most of the time it's quiet, but not without incidents. Living in such a small community, obviously you can't provide for your autistic son everything that he needs. So you have to take him to a town nearby to see therapists for his activities, school and whatnot. Except you haven't been doing very well financially and you don't have a car. Your car broke down, you haven't been able to buy a new one. So for the last year, you've been taking public transportation and calling on friends and taxis to take your son into town for his therapy. And then the war starts, and because you're an ambulance driver, you're out of the house all the time, and you have to leave your autistic son with the neighbors all day, hiding in their safe room from all the rockets coming in, being outside of his element, and of course very scared, and obviously, because of that, regressing after all the hard work with therapists and, and teaching him how to handle himself. Things are very tough for him and he's just not mentally stable. The government evacuates you, you have to leave your house and you're taken to Jerusalem where you put up in a small hotel room together with your son. You make the best of it, but again, he's autistic. He needs his uh, familiar space and it's not possible in a hotel room in a different city next to a highway where it's loud and there's hundreds of families running around with kids climbing up the walls. So regression sets in even further, especially because you don't have his therapists around and you have to find new ones, but of course that all takes time and probably some money and you're not working because you're away from where you, you've been. So you have to make a choice to leave him alone in an unfamiliar hotel room and go get a job or just be there with him all day long. Thankfully, you find a school that's not too far and they're willing to take him and, and actually send transportation to pick him up and drop him off every day. It's a specialized school for children with special needs and they're gonna take your son and work with him. So that means that you can now go find a job. Of course, as an ambulance driver, there's plenty of work and you get a job right away. So there's another problem. You don't have a car to get to work and getting around Jerusalem on public transportation can take hours. And you don't have time to spare. You have to get to work and get back to your son. Miraculously, an organization comes along, finds out about your situation and donates a car so that you can get around. You can now get home faster after work and take your son to therapies and just go out and do stuff, not be cooped up in the hotel room. That car actually gives you peace of mind because... God forbid anything happens to your house and a rocket flies into it, you can drive up north and, and take care of what needs to be taken care of. Or just go see it and, and do upkeep on your house because it's been sitting around for almost a year. And this is just one story of a father that was evacuated from up north with his son. But there's 100,000 people that have left their houses. There's hundreds of rockets flying into these cities every day. Um, fence communities, like I said, smaller uh, communities, big, bigger cities. Uh, the city of Kiryat Shmona is the farthest nor northern city that we have in Israel. And it's a ghost town. There's rockets flying into that town every day, hitting homes, hitting um, a herd of a church, a Christian evangelical church that got their building got uh, impacted, was impacted by a rocket. There's very little peace of mind when you're evacuated. Of course, you're safe, you're with your family. That is great. But the constant stress of thinking what's going to happen to your town, what's going to happen to your home, the need to find new accommodations, the need to find uh, new work while you're away, all that just adds up. When you have such a big number of people that are outside of their element, outside of their homes for so long, the economy 
the morale, the there's so many different social issues that arise from that. Takeaway, I don't think we have any idea of how far this is going to reach, how broad the effects of this war and uh, all the social issues are. And all we can do is pray. Just pray for Israel. Pray for all these people. 100,000 people evacuated from the north. That's all I got to say. And that's my story for today. Come back tomorrow. I'll tell you another one.